see if I can find my place here. Awesome. So we started uh, a couple weeks ago in this new series uh, called I Am, but I want to uh, take a moment before we get into God's Word. I, want, I feel like I should say something, and um, so I'm just going to do that right now. Um, you might be wondering why there's no band. I know that some of you know what's going on in our church, why we're not up here with a live band, and uh, I know that churches normally have a band now, and I get that, and it's not that we don't want one. Uh, we've just made a choice not to have one. Um, the reason being is because when, well, for eight years now, we've been kind of lax, and um, really. Um, our, our standards have been uh, lax, and we've been complacent with this most um, important ministry. Uh, I don't know if there's anything more important. This is coming from someone who's preaching the Word of God, but I don't think there's anything more important in the Church of Jesus Christ than our time of worship. I think that the Word of God is not something that comes... After you worship, I think the goal of Almighty God is that he wants everyone to worship him. And so the, the, the word of God should inspire the worship of God, not the other way around. And so <clears throat> worship is extremely important. And, and so since the scriptures say to care for the flock that God has entrusted to you, I love you and my responsibility to the Lord, number one, and secondly, to you, is to provide at my greatest ability to, to provide the, the best opportunity for you to worship vertically with your creator, to come into this room and be able to connect with him with as little distraction as possible. And so um, we've chosen to, to, to do what we're doing up here on the screen because even though it's not the norm, it's, it's, it's the best that there is. The, these are the greatest worship bands on the planet, and, and, and they don't mess up, and, and, and it's always right, and the words are embedded, and it's, so every time, the reason I'm saying this is because every time we as humans make a mistake up here, it, it, can, it can sever your vertical connection. And so if you're here for an hour or so a week, we want to make sure that you can meet with the Lord in the most powerful way possible. And so our desire is to be able to do that. And so what we're going to do is over the next, I don't know, we're going to, 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 to um, earnestly pursue and recruit the right band. The band that will play in unison. The band that is humble. The band that will submit to authority. The band that loves each other. The band that connects with the Lord. The band that worships up here out of an overflow of worship all week with the songs they've been preparing for. With a band that is prepared. With a band that, that has a level of excellence and expectation that is second to none so that when you come in here, you can climb the mountain of God and come into his presence in a mighty way. That's what we want. And so if you want to be, a, you might have a musical gifting that, that you might have under a bushel, and I hope that you do not. Because if you do, I want to know about it, and, and we want to spend, if it takes uh, six months, if it takes a year, whatever it is, no longer will this church bring anything except excellence to an excellent God. And so if you have a musical gift, I'd love to know about that. And we'll put you to ask of, you know, there's more to a band than singing. They're a small group. They meet with one another. They live life out together. They pray for one another. They spend time together. They work on music together. They create a culture of worship in the church, and that's what we're looking for. I've always felt since day one, way, way back, that music would be the spearhead of this church, not what I'm doing. I love what I'm doing. I feel privileged to do what I do, but music is powerful. And so we want to see that happen here. I'm not expecting you to be Elevation Church or Vertical or, or Hillsong, but this shouldn't be a letdown from there to here. It should be awesome. And so that's the challenge. So um, that's why you don't see a band up here. But um, certainly we're 
thinking that it will happen at some point. I don't know when it is. So we're just waiting on the Lord. Join me in prayer, though. When, you, when the Lord convicts your heart of that, ask him to send the people that we need, you know? That's what the Bible says, that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. <laughs> Very few, right? I mean, the, the workers are none. So, so, so pray that he would send the vocalists and the musicians the ones that, that need to be here, okay? So join me in prayer with that. So anyway... Um, like I said, we started a series a couple of weeks ago uh, called I Am. You know, when, when, when God um, described himself to Moses way back, when, when he charged Moses to go to Pharaoh and, and get the people of Israel out of Egypt, you know, and he's like, well, who are you? And, and God said, well, I am who I am. And, and, and of course, the, we can't describe a, a God that is... That's, that says in his word that the universe is but the fringes of his robe. So if the, if the, if the universe is just the, the string hanging off his shirt, how could, how could he possibly name himself in a way that we could comprehend all that he is? And so he kind of wraps that all up in, I just am. You know, I just am. I am who I am. And, and so we start a series called I Am, big letters. Uh, so, therefore... Uh, little letters, that's you and me. I am, so I am. Like, this is who he is, so this is who I'm supposed to be. You know, the Bible says that, God says that you should be holy like I'm holy. You know, like, God's not like the everyday Joe out there, you know. Did you know that? He's different. He's, he's set apart. He's different. He's not like anybody else. He's not like the everyday Joe walking up and down the street. And he says that we should be like him. So that's, that's the title. I am, so I am. And, and all of the, the entirety of this sermon series will be wrapped up in this one verse. We kind of jump off of it every week, and it's Colossians 3.10 that just says, put on a new nature. So God just doesn't want to save you. He wants to, what? Change you, right? He wants to, God, say, God, change me, God, right? Me. God, change me. And we have to be willing to let him change you. The Bible tells us in Romans 12.2, he says, let, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Let him, right? You have to be willing. So that's what our, our, we should declare that tonight. That's our declaration to the Lord. Lord, change me. He says, put on a new nature as you get to know your creator. And that's what we're doing here. That's what we've been doing for the last, what, four weeks. We're going to continue Tonight, we want to get to know the Creator. He, is, he, is, he said, hey, this is who I am. He, made a, he wrote a book so we could know who he is, right? He's not some far-off God, some Gnostic God that created something, and then he went off in some other universe somewhere, and he's busy over there. No, he's right here. And he wrote a book so we could get to know him, and so that's why we study the Scriptures here at Revolution Church. That's an awesome place for an amen. Okay? amen. That's why we study the Bible. He says, put on a new nature as you get to know your creator and become like him. So, so last week I, I kind of, you know, impromptu, I grabbed my wife and I like to do that. <laughs> and uh, I grabbed my wife and brought her up here and we, and we danced, you know. And I talked about that this whole thing in, in Colossians is, is like a dance. You know, we're, we get to know our creator, but then we have to become like him. And that's not something that you can do on your own. You can't just snap your fingers and become like Jesus. It's just not going to happen. It's a dance. And so as we get to know him, that's his hand. Like when you're dancing and you can feel the hand of the groom and the hand, this hand and this hand on, on, on the bride. And the groom is, because that's what husband and wife is, right? Jesus and his bride. And so as the, as the groom is, is leading with his word, with his spirit, and it's up to us, the bride, to, to give in to that leading. And that's how we become like him. And so we took a, um, a look at some of his uh, nature and his character. The first week we talked about that he sees and he hears and he moves. He doesn't just see and hear what's going on in your life, but he actually does something about it. And then we talked about him being a, a creator. Right there in the first line in the Bible, it says that God created. That's the first thing that he, he identifies himself in all of Scripture is creator. And so he said we're to, he was the creator and he created us in his image to be like him. 
And so we're creative. And so we talked about having a creative juices party. Remember that? And we're going to design the children's wing back here. So it was awesome. And those who didn't think that they were creative, they're creative. And they showed up here that Sunday. And there was like 10 or 12 people here in the room. And we went back there. And we, we walked through with our notepads. And we came up with this awesome idea. And it was based on this idea of grow. Isn't that what we want our children to do? Isn't that what we are supposed to do? Aren't we supposed to be growing in our faith? Aren't we supposed to be maturing in our walk with the Lord? We're supposed to be uh, maturing in faith and maturing in our relationship with the Lord based on truth and not infants in faith acting on feelings. We're supposed to grow. And so we came up with this idea of putting a tree by the blue, which looked like a river. And, and, and you know, the one who meditates on God's word daily is like a tree planted by the river. And its roots are going down. It's drawn up nutrients and it produces fruit in every season. Isn't that what we want for our children? And so that came out of this group of people that maybe didn't think they were very creative, but we are. And so there's a tree growing in the room there. That's awesome. We learned the next week, which was last week, that um, not only does God love, but God is love. He is love. And we learned that we're supposed to love like God loves. And God has compassionate love. He has a, his love is sacrificial. He gives of himself so that we could be blessed. We see that most evident on the cross where he gives his own life so that you could have life. You didn't deserve anything. He didn't deserve what he got, and he exchanged it in this beautiful exchange for you. That's amazing love. And we showed that love as a church also again when we came in on Sunday for the Creative Juices Party. Before we did that, we all sat here, and we brought up the Compassion International site. Remember last week, we talked about changing somebody's life. Not just that you would say. Remember it said, don't just merely say that you love. Show it by the way you act. And we're going to change some little girl's life. And so we decided after looking at the website, we chose a little girl named Alameda. And she's a six-year-old little girl in Africa. She's not even in school. Her village is a place where there's tons of AIDS and this sexual abuse. And kids are being in, sold into the sex slave and all that stuff. And we changed that little girl's life because you all gave enough to, to fund a, a, a one-year sponsorship. Not just $38 a month. But all at one time, we sent it off to Compassion, and so that little girl will be uh, grabbed up by the local church, and they'll, she'll be given an education, they'll, she'll be taught about the Lord, she'll be given some food, she'll be given health needs, you know, checkups and medicine, and so we changed that little person's life, and so I am so super thrilled about that. You could clap. That's a good thing. That's a really good thing. That's awesome. So this week, we're going to take a look at God's nature a, a bit further and, and I want to welcome you to, to open up your Bible to Isaiah chapter 43. Now, it's kind of strange, as, as we talk about this one uh, topic tonight, it's something that we talk about often in the Church of Jesus Christ. It's a frequent topic, but I have a different perspective than probably any, I think probably anybody else in the room in that I'm Jewish. I'm 100% Jewish. I grew up in a Jewish home. We kept kosher, celebrated the holidays, went to temple, lit the candles on Friday night, didn't know why I was doing it, had a bar mitzvah, memorized my haftorah, which I didn't know any idea what it meant, but it meant I was going to get 2,500 bucks to three grand, so I was in. And, but I, I went to temple, and I never heard about this subject here tonight. Never. And, and so in, in the Jewish temple, it never came up. I don't remember ever hearing any talk about this at home with my parents. I never heard about it in temple. I never heard about it in Hebrew school. How many people went to Catholic CCD? Anybody? Well, I went to, I went to, to Hebrew school. It's just the same thing as CCD, right? And, and that's what we did. I went, I went there all the time, three days a week. Totally hated it. But we should have talked about this issue that we're going to talk about tonight. The reason being is because it's been a huge problem since Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, we see that, that man and woman fall into sin. It's the biggest problem for the entire human race. It's been going on since way back when. It's a massive problem that we cannot fix. A human being cannot fix this problem. Like, I'm not super smart, but I think that there's probably something that we could do to fix most problems, if not all. But this one, we can't because, like, it doesn't matter how good you are. It says that your goodness is filthy rags to God. 
And it also says that even if you keep every one of his rules, it says that keeping the law will not make you right with him. So you got a huge, huge problem, and it's never been brought up in temple. All those years, 13 years, on my 13th birthday, I had my bar mitzvah. But leading up to that, I'm in temple all the time. I'm in Hebrew school all the time. I'm living in a, in a Jewish home that, that respects and honors the holidays and the Sabbath, and they make me stay home from the, from the basketball games on Friday night so I could light the, what we would call Shabbos candles, Sabbath, and everyone else is having fun. And I'm, so I'm in like in this kind of deeply religious family, but never is this brought up, ever. So it seems strange to kind of bring it up Tonight, in, in, in the Old Testament, you'd think they would, have, they would have taught about it, but they didn't. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, I am, there it is, I am, right? You see it there? I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. That's good news, right? You want to know what's really good news about it? Do you notice right there in the middle of the verse, it says, for my own sake? It kind of takes the pressure off, right? That means that you don't have to try to earn it. You know, like only the good guys get this, or only the nice girls get this. No, no, no. See, it's in his nature to want to do this. It's for his own sake. Like he's doing it for you, and if you're, if you're forgiven of your sins, that's good news. But just don't ever think that you're at the center of everything, that that's why he did it. He did it for his own sake. Now, this is not in the scriptures. I like to walk away from the pulpit when I say things that are not in the Bible, right? But this is just kind of my opinion. I don't know. if When you read, you can, you can do whatever you want. But, but when I'm reading, I like to try to put myself in there and try to think about these things. You know, it says, like I said a moment ago, the one who meditates on God's word day and night, right? So I like to meditate on it because I don't want to know what in the world it means. Well, for my own sake, I start thinking about that. Well, what would that mean? Well, you know, in all of creation, I know it's hard to believe, but you're his greatest thing. You're his greatest thing. We don't think too highly of ourselves that way. Like, I mean, because we look at Mount Everest, like, wow. And you see, like, the, the, a cheetah, and it's like all the spots and these beautiful things in nature. And it's hard to believe that, that in God's eyes, you're actually better than that stuff. You're, you're better than, 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 than Jupiter with the rings or Saturn with the rings around. Like, you're the height of his creation because you are the only thing that was created in his image to be like him. So, like, when someone looks at you, they see God. So, I'm just thinking for his own sake. I'm thinking he, he, he creates us in his own image, and then we sin, and I'm thinking God's thinking... There's no way that I'm going to let my best work go straight to hell forever. That's not going to happen. I'm not going to allow that to happen. This is my best work, and I'm not going to fail because I don't. Right? So he's like, I'm going to make a way to fix this. And so he sends Jesus. That's just my thought. That, I mean, you can do what you want with it. But I'm thinking if it's for his own sake, he's like, I am not going to fail because I just don't. So I'm going to win. And so he says, for his sake... He's going to remember your sins no more. Remember, God is love. And in the love verses in 1 Corinthians, which we touched on last week, you'll know that it says love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. That's who God is. He, he doesn't remember your sin. It's like, what sin? Did you, did you sin? Like, I don't, I don't remember seeing your sin. Like, who's, who's in this room has sinned? Right, but here's the thing. If you've given your life to Christ, God doesn't remember them. Did you ever hear someone say that, that nothing's impossible for God? That he can do whatever he wants? He can do anything? Anyone ever hear that? That's not true. It's not true. He cannot remember your sin if he forgave you. You understand? He can't. It says, I will not remember your sin. I'll tell you one thing he can't do. He cannot lie. And he said he will not remember it. So he cannot drum up an old sin from the past that he's already forgiven. Amen. just doesn't happen. Okay. So what does it mean to forgive? Well, it means to pardon someone. Yeah, I know you did it, but um, you're not guilty of that. You're not in trouble anymore. Freedom. 
That's one word, synonym, freedom. Uh, to leave. It's like, <laughs> I'm over here and, 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 and I sinned. I did something over here. And, and, and he says that now you're going to just kind of leave that sin right there and you're going to go over there. And you're not going to be over there anymore. Sin, the sin is gone. You see, wiped out, erased, put away forever. That, that's, that's what forgiving of sin is. And so how does God accomplish this um, amazing, amazing work? How, how, how does he forgive this? How can he possibly take this, speaking of Everest, this Everest of, of transgression and sin and failure in your life that you bring to the cross? How can he do that? This most amazing thing that we should be so grateful for and so thankful for. And we should be partying about this all the time that we've been forgiven. How, how does he do that? He does it. Acts 5.31 says, tells us of Jesus on the cross dying and Jesus on the throne saving as prince and savior forgiving sin. Acts 13.38 says, brothers, listen. Exclamation mark. So what should you do? Listen. Amen. You know, I think that the more you get involved, and the more you interact, I think that those folks that are watching, Mike, Mike Gray, hey, you guys, why don't you say hello to Mike and Cindy? Say, hey, hey. they're on Facebook. Hey, Tyler. Well. Right. Hey, Tyler. <laughs> Miss you all. But I think that when we, when we interact, it helps the message go out more powerfully. Yeah. I think so. Acts 13, 38 says, Brothers, listen! Through this man, Jesus Christ, there is forgiveness of sin. Everyone, look at someone say everyone. everyone. Even you. <laughs> everyone who believes is made right in God's sight. Hebrews 9, 26 says, But now, once for all time. Now. How about now? Now. Not, not, not just yesterday, now, right now, right now. But now, once for all time, he has appeared to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. Awesome, awesome news. So, I am, big letters, forgives. So, I am, must forgive. So I jotted four things down about forgiveness. It's how to, how often, how much, and how come. You should, you should jot this stuff down. Um, I don't want to go in order, though. I was thinking about this. I started going in order, and I realized that we can't go in order. The first one has to, we've got to go where the power is, right? We've got to go where the power is. The power is in the fourth one, the how come. How, why would we do anything unless we know why? So, so let's start with number four. How come, right? How come we're supposed to forgive? How come we forgive? Well, it's because of this. First and foremost, because God says so. Uh, raw, baseline obedience, right? We don't talk about that a lot in church. We're trying to coerce people into obeying. We're trying to coerce people into, into doing what God wants. And, and if you like it, you'll do it. How about this? Thus saith the Lord, Amen. right? We need a little bit more of that in the church. Yes. Thus saith the Lord. God said to, to do this. He said to forgive, so we're supposed to. Uh, Ephesians 4.32. Like, I wouldn't just yell at you like that unless I had a verse, right? You guys want a verse? How about two? Ephesians 4.32 says, instead, and you're going to look at this up, and he tells you all the stuff that you're all doing now. But instead of that, be kind to each other. We could just stop there. Yes. Amen. Good night. Yes. Tender hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Let me just ask you a question. When you read that verse, how much wiggle room was there in there? Show me how much. Right? Yeah. And so, so I think this is a hard message to receive. I get that. But I think we just have the responsibility to the Lord and to his word to tell the truth. And, and, and the Bible says that we all fail in many ways. And I think that instead of being hyper-grace, we could just say that there's some grace 
when we fail. I get that. But it does say, do it. It doesn't say, hey, here's a good idea. I just met you tonight, and you seem nice, so I'm going to forgive you. It just seems like a good idea. Say it does not say that. Right? It does not say that. Here's, that's not stern enough, though, so here's some more. Colossians 3.13 says, Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive, oh boy, anyone. Yeah, even the person you're thinking about right now. Including the guy yelling at you. Forgive anyone who offends you. Oh, you offended me. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you, here it is, must forgive others. Okay, so Debbie said that it was less than 0% chance of wiggling on the previous verse. What is this one then? Like, you must forgive anyone who offends you. Who wants to do this? I don't. I like being mad at you. I need something to complain about. I'm Jewish. That's what we do. I want to complain about stuff. It's my nature to do that. But God says we're supposed to forgive everyone. So, so yeah, thank you. Love you. We can't just say, oh, you know, I love God and I believe in him, but disregard his commandments. That's rampant. But really, the truth is, is completely opposite of, the, of that, really. In 1 John 5, 3, it says, to the contrary, it says, and I quote, loving God means keeping his commandments. You know, that, you, can't, you can't say, well, I love Jesus, and, 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 but, but I, and I believe in him, and I'm going to heaven when I die, but I'm just disregarding this section because I don't like that. I'm not going to let you go of that because I don't want to. I've seen a sticker on a car that says, I love Jesus, but I cuss a little. Listen. Grace when we fail, no reason to, to boast and brag about your failures, right? That's not where we're at. We're to be growing in the truth, not, not, not acting like spiritual infants on, and, and just saying, it's, it's just okay that I, no, it's not okay. It's not okay. Grace when you fail, but it's not okay. It should bother you that you cuss. Because the Bible says, let no unclean word come out of your mouth. Only words that encourage and uplift. That's what it says. Does it say, if you cuss, you're going to hell? No. But it's, it just says you shouldn't do it. And so don't glamorize and, and boast that it's okay. It's not okay to do that. And it's not okay to slap it on your car and, and publicize it to the world and, and, and assume that this is the welcome carpet to everyone that says, oh, you can come to church because it's okay to cuss. No, it's not okay to cuss. You can come in the front door with your filth, but hopefully you're transitioning through the place, if you will, and you're coming out cleaner and changed. And you should desire to be changed. It's like saying, I love Jesus. Did you ever hear this one? I love Jesus. I hate the church. Anyone ever hear that one? All the time. Listen, Jesus died for the church. Jesus leads the church. Jesus is building the church. Jesus is one with the church. He's the groom, and the church is the bride. You can't tell me you love me and hate Meredith. It doesn't work that way, right? You can't say, I love Meredith, but that Moses, I can't stand him. If you hate me, you hate her. You hate her, you hate me. You hate the church, you hate Jesus. He loves the church. So you can't just have one or the other. If he says do it, you do it. So we do it because we're, we're called to obey. And here's the second reason. How come? How come? How come I have to forgive? Well, because it's for your own good. Tells us to do something. Deuteronomy 10.13 says, And you must always obey the Lord's commands. That's pretty clear, right? Anyone need any theology, any explanation, any her hermeneutical study on that? Nothing? 
Okay. Oh, you must always obey the Lord's commands and decrees I am giving you today. Why? For your own good. It says that. See, we, 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 none of us, including yours truly, are living the life that I could be living. Jesus said in John 10.10 10, that I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. And no one is living that thing out 100%. No one's, no one's rocking on that thing yet. No, no one's varsity team on that. We're all ju junior varsity on that. We're not allowing God to bless us with an amazing life. We don't even know what that life looks like because we haven't started obeying the rules the way he says to. If we would do what he says, he says it's for your own good. So how is it, you say, for my own? Well, how is, what does it look like? What do you mean for my own good? Well, let's look. Let's look what I'm talking about. He says to forgive, right? So let's look at uh, Matthew 6. Look at Matthew 6. Two verses, 14 and 15. It's for your own good. It's for your own good. I don't want anyone to be behind. I want you to go there. I want you to read it. It's the first book in the New Testament. It's about three quarters of the way through the book. Y'all there? Okay, I don't want to lose anybody. This is super important. Two ver I'm going to read two, two, two uh, verses, one in Matthew and one in Mark. Matthew 6, 14 says this. If you forgive, and that's, that's what we're looking for, right? We're, we're, God's going to push us to forgive tonight. You know that, right? Yeah. Okay, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. He wants you to forgive. If, that's a big word, right? If, that's like a condition, isn't it? It's not just a, it's not like a, it's not, it's just a, it's a condition. It's a, it's, it's, it's like if you do this then something's going to happen. So if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. That's good news, right? Yes. But the next verse, not so good. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Contemplate that for a minute and go with me to Mark chapter 11. Mark 11, 1 verse, verse 25. I love the way this, the pages sound when you turn them. I like that. Someone to my left is making me real happy. Love you. Okay, here we go. Are you ready? Verse 25, Luke 11. But when you are praying, doesn't say anything about if you're praying. Kind of says when, right? Because Christians pray. Well, but when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Like it wouldn't have, you know, who grew up in a church where their parents said, you better be quiet, church, pull your ear, right? Come on, put your hand up, right? Listen, it wouldn't offend this preacher to hear someone crashing against that door heading out of here when we get ready to pray. It wouldn't offend me at all because if, if, if the Bible is true, and it is, yeah, if it's true, then, then, then when we're praying, half the church should be peeling out of here, right? That would be bad. Like, no one's going to say that to their church. I'm an idiot, really, right now. I'm telling you to leave, right? I'm trying to beg people to come, and I'm telling you to leave. But the Bible says if you're getting ready to pray and you got something against somebody, go make it right before you come to this altar. Right? So, so if the door's swinging wide open that way as we're getting ready to pray, that's okay. And, and why? See, something on the line here. It says, so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Amen. These sections of Scripture, it's going to get a little deep here. Let me start out by saying we're a non-denominational church, okay? I'm not a Baptist. I'm not a Methodist. I'm not Presbyterian. I'm not a Calvinist. I'm not an Arminian. I'm not a continuationist. I'm not a cessationist. I'm a Christian. I don't know what you are, and that's up to you. But there's camps within Christianity that fight about stuff. And, and, and listen, no matter, no matter, let's just put it this way, no matter what you think about these verses, it ain't removing God from his throne. It's not going to. You know, because the whole universe and God's kingdom is not waiting for Holly to make a decision. It's just not. You know, he loves you, and I love you, but it's not, you, like, you don't have any weight in that. 
You've got no power in that. You're not going to decide his authority. And, and really, what we're going to talk about here is not really about somebody's salvation, really, to be, to be honest with you. It's not, going to, it's not going to change how salvation happens. God's already determined how that's going to work. So you don't get to decide how salvation works. You can respond. But there's areas of the faith that people fight about, and there's all kinds of denominations and camps and tribes that fight about stupid stuff. Stuff like this. Um, is some people think that you need to get baptized to be saved, that like part of the salvation process is that you have to get baptized. There's, there's churches that believe that. That's fine. Some people think that baptism is, is a symbolic thing, a choice of the will of someone who's able to think about this and make a decision for Jesus, who decides to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of their life in here, and then here is an outward display of an inward decision. Some people think that, and that's okay too. But let me just say this. Christians, get baptized. Jesus said in the commission, go make disciples and baptize them. So there's no room, no matter where you fall in that argument about whether you have to get baptized or you don't have to get baptized, but nowhere in the Bible does it say not to get baptized. So I'm just telling you, non-denominational revolution church, if you're a Christian, get baptized. Okay? That's what you're supposed to do. The same applies to forgiveness. Some would sense the need to take these verses that I just shared with you. Let me, let me just share, paraphrase. If you forgive them, your Father will forgive you. If you refuse to forgive them, your Father will not forgive you. When you're getting ready to pray and you have a grudge, forgive that person so your Father in heaven will forgive you. You read those, right? Well, some people sense the need to reduce this statement of the second person of the Trinity down to forgiven people Forgive. That's common. But some, including myself, would say no. Not at all. It is written, if you don't, he won't. That's what it says. Now, me forgiving you does not save anybody. Right? Right. Believing in Jesus and following him saves. Yeah, I got that. I got that for sure. So the question is, is am I, when I read these verses, am I somehow negating the salvation that Jesus gave me by forgiving my sins, by not forgiving the sins of others? Now you need to make that decision. I've made mine. But I read what it says, and I don't like it when people say, in effect, what God is saying. No. Let me tell you what God's saying. He wrote what he's saying. And he doesn't need my help or your help to try to, to, to try to explain it or write a commentary on it. He wrote a commentary. It's called the Bible. And it says, if you don't forgive, I'm not going to forgive. So I would suggest to you, if you want to figure this thing out, I would look at the words of Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to read the whole thing to you tonight. But I would suggest, and you should write this down, that you would read Matthew 18, verses 23 through 35. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but let me paraphrase it for you, just to get some clarity on what this means. And again, you decide what you want to decide on it, but I've made my decision. This parable of Jesus Christ says that there's a person that has a debt that they can't pay. Anybody ever have one of those? Everyone in this room should raise their hand you got a sin problem that you can't fix, right? And so the master brings you in front of him and waves, pardons, frees the person of the debt. Awesome! Right? And the person then goes out and won't forgive other people like his master forgave him. And it says in the Bible that the master brings that person back, throws them in prison to be tortured. How many people in heaven are going to be tortured? Hold up the sign. None, right? None. You believe what you want, but uh, verse 35 is the scary part of it all. Right at the end, he says, that's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you don't forgive. I'm just saying, like, you do what you want with it. I've made up my mind. 
And I'm not getting anywhere near that cliff. <laughs> and the Lord has worked, on, worked in my office. I have, a, I have a sign on my door. Before I come out to see you every week, it says, has the text worked you over? That, the, that preaching is theology coming from a man on fire. Moses has the text worked you over yet. He worked me over this week. I am so guilty of this. I got to get right. Big time. He has worked on me in this regard massively. Now listen, just like baptism, however you fall on this argument, however you fall on this topic, I just want to say, let this parable, as I pray that you will read it this week, let it instill in you a, a, an urgency and the importance of you forgiving. It's massively important. Okay? Now, let's talk about how to forgive. How to forgive. And you're going to see, actually, as we unpack this, it's more accurately stated it's going to become a when to forgive, really. But it's how do we, how do, we do this thing? How do we forgive? Well, Colossians 3.13 that I read to you a moment ago, this whole idea of making an allowance for each other's faults, that's a, this is the New Living Translation, and this is a thought-for-thought thought translation, and it's a decent attempt at clarity. What it's saying is make an allowance for faults. So it's, like, it's almost like saying, hey, Mike, I'm going to give you... Um, here, I've got a, a bucket full of, of free passes for you to sin against me. I'm giving it to you in advance because I know you're going to do it, and I'm already deciding in advance that I'm going to give you a free pass and I'm going to forgive you. That's what making an allowance for, a, for faults is all about. right? But that's not really the best attempt at clarity. I'm going to go back to the King James. Herb, amen? Okay. Every once in a while, i got to throw her a bone because I love you. It says, forbearing and forgiving one another, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. Forbearing. Now, forbearing, forbear is a past participle. It means it's, it's a verb that's already been completely accomplished already. So he's telling us to do something that's already been decided in the past. The decision to forgive is not done in the moment. It's done in advance of this thing. It means I'm putting up with your errors because I decided in advance to do so. It's not in the moment. If you leave it up to the moment, it's not going to happen because you're angry and you're frustrated and you're annoyed, right? And you're offended. That's a popular one in America. You're offended. And so when you're offended and you're angry, it's, it's difficult to give someone a free pass. Right? It's hard to do that. I'm going to forgive you when you hurt me. I'm going to forgive you when you disappoint me. I'm going to forgive you when you cheat me or cheat on me because I decided in advance to give you an allowance, a free pass to do so. The only thing that should be happening in the moment is self-reminding self of the commitment you made before to forgive people in advance for what they do in the future. That's what should be happening in the moment. Make the decision now. Like now. Right now. That's not part of the speech, man, y'all. This is now. Make a decision now. This is what I want you to do is make a decision now. That's Jesus. And I am, so I am, is because Jesus was, the, was the, the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the earth, right? That means God's decision to forgive you of the sin you committed today wasn't made today. It was made before the foundations of the earth. Way, way, way back. How far back? Ask me how far back. I have no idea. A long time ago, he decided to forgive you through Christ Jesus. In the moment, remember, this should only be a reminder of the decision you've made in the past to forgive people. So first we decide now to forgive in the future. That's what we do. That's how to. That means before you leave tonight, we would like to see you make that decision. 
that I'm going to be like Jesus did. I'm going to make a decision today to forgive people moving forward. Because guess what? You know I'm going to tick you off in the future. And the only way for this thing to really work for the long haul is that we make a decision right now to, to uh, Carl, I'm going to let you offend me. Susan, I'm going to let you offend me. Joe, I'm going to let you offend me. That, that, this is just the way it's going to be. Like, if I don't do that, because you're going to, right? I mean, we all do. And if, so we make a decision in advance. That decision in the moment is not going to happen. Very unlikely. Because I'm mad. Who wants to be nice when they're mad? Nobody wants to be nice when they're mad. So we make a decision now to forgive in the future. Okay, so here's the, here's the second thing. How often? Well, let's look at um, Luke 17, 3 and 4. Let's look at Luke 17, 3 and 4. Go there with me, please. Let's hear it. Come on. Let's hear it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, buddy. 17, 3 and 4. See, you got to when you preach, you got to get a you got to get a Bible that has flop value. You see? No, it's just the right size. You can get some big ones that don't flop though, but you got to get the right kind. They teach that in seminary. Just totally kidding. That's about as worthless as some of the stuff they teach in seminary, but they do. Te- anyway, watch this. Look at verse three. Right? I'm gonna get loud. So watch yourselves. So I kind of like, I guess he kind of just wants you to pay attention here, right? Pay attention. If another believer, a brother or sister in Christ, if they sin, rebuke that person. That doesn't mean tell them they're a jerk. It just really means, hey, this is the word of God and this is what you did. Look at the difference. Rebuke that person. Right? We're not supposed to just be doormats and just say, oh, it's okay, because if you just go, oh, it's okay, then the person never learns. So you should say something, right? Then, so if you, if you tell the person, hey, you've wronged me, this is what you did, but this is the word of God, look at the difference. Then if there is repentance, like in other words, if they change their opinion, if they say, yeah, you know, here's what I did, and here's the word of God, and you're right. The word of God's right, and I'm not. That's repentance. And I don't want to do that anymore. I'm sorry I did that to you, Carl. So if there's repentance, forgive. Not maybe. Not sometimes. You got to. Watch this. Even if that person wrongs you, even if that person wrongs you seven times a day, and each time turns again and asks for forgiveness, you must, say must, forgive. Um, Where in there, let me ask you a question. I asked you this, I I mentioned this months and months ago, but where in that verse does it say that it's genuine repentance, that they meant it? Because it doesn't say it in my Bible. Does it say it in the King James? What What verse are you reading? Yeah. I don't know where it says... It has to be real. You're the Holy Spirit now, and you get to look in that person's heart and see if it was a genuine repentance. It says, if they wrong you, and they repent and say, please forgive me, what do you got to do? You have to. It doesn't say maybe. It says you have to. Well, you might ask yourself, well, what if there's no repentance? What if there's no remorse? What if there's no desire from that other person to be forgiven? What, what, what if, I don't think I'm wrong. Right? Who likes that guy? What now? Am I off the hook? I mean, he didn't ask for, repent, he didn't ask for forgiveness. He, he didn't express repentance to me. Am I off the hook? Well, let me just tell you something. When I mentioned a moment ago about God working me over, he has raked me over the coals this week. And, and, and let me just, I have a lot to say about this. I, 
I would invite you into, into to greater levels of participation in the body of Christ through your local church because this working over of your pastor didn't happen just while I was studying. This working over of your, of your pastor came from studying this week about this. It came in and don't say, oh, you don't invite me to your house. You start your own small group. I got one that meets at my house on Tuesday nights with people, no offense, as I prayed, God put the names in my head. So that's what I'm doing. But I would, like, I, would, I, would, I would encourage you strongly to launch a small group in your home and start meeting people from this church in your home once a week, break bread, hang out, pray. Listen, we, we talked about this week about, we talk about the message, and, and we talked about loving and forgiving people. Last week was love, this week's forgive, and and, I, and we start going around the room, well, who, 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 do you, who do you have a hard time loving? Who do you have a hard time forgiving, right? Everybody have one of those people? Come on, right? Everyone's got one. You're just smiling like crazy because you don't want to raise your hand. I know you got one, right? We all got one. Seven of them. All right, this message is for you. Let's go down here and sit with Bonnie. So, <laughs> so I got, I've got two of them. I got two. So we're going around the room, and, and, and I'm sharing with them, and... I think I'm justified, and I'm like, so tell me if you can track with this. It's easy to forgive someone that does something to you, but it's really not easy to forgive someone or love someone who continues to pick the scab. Come on, right? It's hard, right? Every time I say, okay, Bethany, I forgive you, and then the next week you come over and you kick me again. Bethany, I forgive you, and you kick me again. Bethany, I forgive you, and you kick me Come on, right? We got those people? I got two people like that. I got my ex-wife. No. And I got my dad. And, and I have a hard time forgiving and I have a hard time loving them because they just, they just don't, they don't stop. They just don't stop. And I'm going around the room in my small group and I was admitting this. I was saying, that's, it's hard for me. And we started praying about that, and we were sitting, and Ramon was with us, and Ramon's a great guy, and, and, we were, and he was sharing something about he struggled with that, but the Lord spoke to him about this and this and this and shared what the Lord had done in his life, help him with that. And, and I just started to, to pray for my dad and for my ex-wife. and Man, it's hard, it's hard, but listen, I, I was using that as a crutch. I was using it as a crutch to continue to hate them because they were constantly picking the scab. And the problem with that is that what they do has nothing to do with what I do. Amen. Yeah, that's the problem. So God worked me over this week. And, and, and I needed to change. Let me show you where, what I'm talking about, Matthew 18. We see the people that repent and ask for forgiveness. That's one thing. But Matthew 18 21 and 22. Peter comes to Jesus and and he asks him a question. Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Does it say anything about asking for forgiveness? Does it? Nothing. The last verse said, if they ask for forgiveness, you should do something. Endlessly. You always forgive. It said every time they ask for forgiveness, you grant it, right? That's what it said. Now this, this one here says, it doesn't say anything about repentance or asking for forgiveness. This is the, I'm not wrong guy. But how many times should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Bethany, if you kick me seven times, I'm supposed to forgive that. But Jesus, as he always does, he raises the bar. Uh, No, not seven times, Jesus replied. Uh, Seventy times seven. So if, if, if someone asks for forgiveness and repents, or apparently does, we're supposed to grant it every single time. So I'll just say this, and we're not to be legalists, but let's just, just so you have an idea. If someone offends you and offends you, offends you, and doesn't ask for forgiveness, you should at least give them 490 forgivenesses. It's just, just kind of throwing that out there. And the reason why I can say that and not be legalistic is because I think you get the point. What 
Well, he or she keeps picking the scab. How many times have you returned to your sin well? Yet God forgives you in Christ. So I have to forgive in advance, and it stands at least 490 times. Times seven. Got a scientific calculator, y'all? How often? So how much? How much? To what extent? Well, I mean, I can overlook this or that, right? But it's, well, what you did is still there. And if this continues, and you continue to do that to me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back over there. I'm going to grab up all this stuff that you did that I overlooked, and boom, I'm going to throw it back in your face. That's common. Yeah. A temporary reprieve from blame and punishment is not forgiveness. And a sweeping under the rug to be used as leverage for tomorrow's fight is not forgiveness. Remember what it says, just as the Lord forgave you, so also must you. So what does that look like? That just as Jesus, when it talks about how much. Psalm 103, 12 says, he has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. That means that all the way to the east side of the universe, that's pretty far away, right? That's all the way out there. That's where your sin is. And you are all the way down the other end of the universe. All the way. How far away is that? I don't even know how far away that is. But it's super far away. And, and that's, that's where your sin is compared to where you are in God's eyes. But see, we're not like that. We tend to keep our sins, like the other people's sins, and our own sins at arm's length so we can grab them when we need them. Right, don't we? Come on now. But that's not forgiveness. That's not true forgiveness. That's not God-style forgiveness. He says that he blots out, he erases, he removes, and he sends away the sin as if it never happened, right? We'll close with one verse, and I, then we're going to sing to the Lord. Bring up that screen. You see that in Isaiah? See, Isaiah says, come, now let's settle this. Let's do this right now. See, though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow, right? He says, let's, let's get this thing done right now, right? That's what he wants to do. He wants to get rid of your sin. He wants to erase it. He wants to blot it out so that like it was never there before. But listen, let's get this thing done now. Before we make a decision to, to, to forgive other people of their sins, he said, let's get this thing, let's settle this once and for all. Let's repent personally of your sin and ask Jesus Christ to save you by his work on the cross to pay for your sin so that your sin, which is as red as scarlet, can be made as white as snow. Blot it out, erase. Look, what happened to the sin? It's gone. It's like it was never there. And that's what he wants to do in you. And so he says, don't put it off. Don't wait to make a decision. Every person who died yesterday in an accident didn't know it was coming. I'm not the gloom and doom guy, but it happens. He said, let's settle this thing right here, right now. Let's repent of our sin. Let's, let's seek the forgiveness that God wants to give you. And then, in response to this amazing gift of blotting out your sin like it was never even there, he wants you to forgive just like him. In advance, completely, 
every time to everyone who would offend you. Who thinks that's easy? Anyone? You know what it's going to take? Right here. The dance. Why don't you stand up for a second? Come on, stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Come on, stand up. I know this sounds goofy, right? But just as a show, play some music, Danielle. But as a show of your willingness for God to work with you, go like this. Come on now, just do it. Don't be ashamed. Kill the lights in here, guys. Kill the lights so nobody's embarrassed. Kill the lights, all of them. Spotlights, done. No, 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 play the songs, the next songs. We're going to worship, we're going to dance. It takes God's leading and you following. Come on, bring up the next song. There we go. Dance. Dance with him. You can, you can do it if you want, or you can put your arms down whenever, but just dance. Let him lead you. Let him lead you, and you follow. <laughs>